Hello everybody, welcome. It's Public Eye Life this Friday, June 12. June 12 in Nigeria is a very important date. I can see you all joining. Thank you for joining. Um, June 12 is a very important date in Nigeria. I know that a lot of you on social media are much younger. So I'm imagining that many, many people don't fully know the implication of June 12 in Nigeria. I remember where I was June 12, 1993. And I remember hearing the announcement that the election had been annulled and just the complete de dejection that I felt at that time. It's been 27 years since then and we've had democracy for 27 years. Where exactly are we and where ought we to have been? We're going to have a very interesting conversation today. I have two people um, to talk with. The first person is the governor of Kaduna State here in Nigeria and that's Malam El Rufai. Um, also, I will be talking to my dear friend, um, Hafsat Abiola. But then it's not just that, I'm just pulling around. Of course, you know that Hafsat Abiola is the daughter of MK Obiola, who was the winner of that election in 1993, and who was subsequently jailed and eventually um, controversially passed on years later by 1998. Also, she lost her mother during the struggle. So we're going to have a very... Um, reflective conversation, I think, about democracy, about Africa, and also about where we are in the world generally concerning black people and what Africa's role will be in all of that. So don't go away, join me. Throughout the conversation, you can send me questions right under there at the question box. In a second, I will have Malamel Rufai, Governor of um, Cardinal join us um, for the first conversation. Yes, here you are. Yes, Fumi, how are you? Fine, thank you. Good evening, Your Excellency. Good evening. Long time no see. Don't Excellency me. Now you be Excellency. Are you not, are you not, tonight I was going to say that we must behave. I haven't seen you in 10 years, Malam. Yes, more than 10 years. 10 years. More than 10 years. You've abandoned me. Uh, this is what all of you say, but this is not true. You know, Malam, I want to start this conversation in a very in an interesting way. You know, me and you, the last time we had talk, about governance and democracy was in yes. 2009 at the Aspen Meadows. Yes. We have a mutual friend of ours there, whom I won't name now, whom you were encouraging to go into government. You were also accusing the likes of me for not going into government. I yes. asked you if you were going to go into government. You said you were not going to go into government. Yes. You, you lied. I didn't lie. <laughs> I didn't lie. I, at the time, I was despondent, you know, I was very, very angry and discouraged about the persecution I was going through after my years of service. I felt that I gave my best uh, time, talent, everything as a DG of BP and Minister of FCT. I did what I felt was best for the country. But what I got in return from someone who was like an elder brother to me, Umar Musaradua, of blessed memory, was persecution. I was exiled. I was, you know. So I, I, at the time, I was in no mood to be back in government. But I also realized how important government is. Yeah. I, 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 I have no doubt in my mind that countries that make progress only do so when their best and brightest are in government. Yes. In Nigeria, our best people are not. Our best people work for telecoms companies, banks, and uh, the oil sector. Would yeah. you say, you know, that experience, you were slightly depressed? And I mentioned this because, you know, going through this period where the world has had to go on this big pause, mental mm -hmm. health has been an issue for people globally around the world. And oftentimes yeah. people think that powerful people or people in positions of authority do not deal with mental health issues. Would you say at that time you were struggling mentally? I was. I was. Um, look, you know, to, to, to spend uh, eight years of your life doing something that you believed in, and then you find that, you know, the first, you, you are not appreciated. Second, people that you thought you trusted, people that you worked with betrayed you. Uh, you know, the combination of that plus exile, plus being away from your children, from your wives, you know, that combination, you know, will always lead to mental health challenges. 
um, yeah. I was supported by, 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 by my children, by my spouses, and a few friends. Most, most friends just walked away. Some stopped taking my calls because I was the target of in multiple investigations. The government clearly didn't like me. And, you know, I was abandoned by many of my government friends. And this is another lesson. You know, there are friends, there are friends of office. And you have to learn to differentiate that. But I think I was lucky. Uh, I had a plan to keep busy for two years after I left office. You know, So my first year after I left office, I spent in London to finish my LLB, which I started years back. The second year, I was at the Harvard Kennedy School, and I was extremely busy, okay? These okay. two years kept me very busy, which helped, along with the support of friends and family, to deal with the mental health issues. But frankly, but for those uh, two very intensive academic uh, engagements, maybe I would have gone mad, completely mad. Because it is, it is heartbreaking to see people that you thought you trusted, that you did things together, denying you ever did it together, you know, and just going their own way. And in fact, I think that, you know, uh, senior uh, government officials, powerful people, are more at risk of mental health issues when they leave office. Right. Uh, and sometimes even during office, right. uh, during their tenure of office than, than, than other people, because they are under greater pressures and they are more likely to face... Uh, uh, all the all the evil sides of human nature betrayal you know uh, double cross and so on and so forth uh, right. it, it is it is something that applies to everyone but many people are not conscious of it and that's why you see that um, many people that leave office after some time they just collapse literally yeah, you became governor this is your second time around and then all of a sudden, this thing happened around the world. There was a pandemic around the world. And of all people to get it, you were one of the people to get it. It was like your enemies had caught you. <laughs> well, you know, I, I consider myself a very lucky person. Many people think I, 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 I am very strategic. I plan. I'm smart and all that. That's not it. Um, I'm just of average uh, intelligence and capacity. But I am very lucky. Um, I was very lucky to have, called, uh, to have picked a public health uh, uh, consultant as my running mate, uh, Dr. Hadiza Balarabi. You know, I was criticized for it. People saw her as a Muslim. They called it Muslim, Muslim ticket. But for some reason, the way Amana she emerged as my running mate uh, can only be divine intervention. And here I was... Uh, with this uh, public health uh, uh, expert as deputy. Uh, she had dealt with Ebola before in the FCT. She had dealt with Lassa fever, so she knows what infectious diseases are all about. So I was lucky in that way. Secondly, I also picked another very capable woman, Dr. Amina Baloni, as our commissioner of health. She, she was working in the UN system. We had to wait six months. We delayed appointing a commissioner of health for six months because we wanted her to disengage neatly from the United Nations system. And she was also a public health expert. So by the time the coronavirus pandemic emerged, I had two people that were experts in the area that were technical experts. I know nothing about public health. I've never been involved in any public health issues, but they knew. And you know, they, they, they sort of framed the gravity of the situation to us in the government. So we understood the coronavirus pandemic ahead of many people. And Kaduna State was the first state in Nigeria to lock down on the 26th of March. Mm. And I think uh, COVID-19 decided, you bastard, I'm going to get you. So I was the first person. I was the first person in Kaduna to get COVID-19. Two days after I had locked down the state, I tested positive for COVID-19. It was very strange, weird, but that's how it was. So again, I consider it God's blessing and luck for many reasons. First, I think it showed the people of the state that were not taking this thing seriously, that this is serious, this is real. Second, you know, it also forced me to go into isolation, thereby handing over the decision making regarding the response to the pandemic to the deputy governor and the commissioner of health. So they took technical decisions. They didn't take political decisions. 
They did not yeah. care if the decisions were unpopular. But we agreed from day one that the most important thing we have to do is to protect lives. Because the pandemic pre yeah. presents a trilemma, okay? How do you protect lives, livelihoods, and liberties at the same time? It's a trilemma. It's not a dilemma. And you have to choose what is important. And in Kaduna State, because I had this, because I had this public health experts, we, we decided from day one that we will protect lives, we'll sacrifice liberty, we'll sacrifice livelihoods and apologize afterwards, but we'll protect lives and we'll lock down. I mean, I'll take you up on that sacrificing liberty because one of the big issues was that you basically took people's civil servants' money, 25% of their, of their salary, and you said, I want that, and you took, I think, 50% of public officers. You know, that's yeah. not democratic, Malam. You simply took it. And did what with it, really? It is, it, is, it is democratic. It is democratic. The State Executive Council debated this, took a decision, and we, 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 we conveyed to uh, the head of service to go and engage with the civil servants and so on. It was democratic. We, political office holders, sacrificed even more. Okay, now, what is the logic behind it? The logic behind it is this, Fumi. If we collect 5 billion naira from the Federation account in a month, and we spent 5.5 billion naira on salaries to less than 1% of the population, you know, virtually collected everything we got from Abuja. 1% of the population is the civil service, the public service. There, what about the 99%? What do they get? That's one. Secondly, if we are conscious of our common humanity, in times of pandemic, we come together. We sacrifice for each other. Now, we have locked down the state. There are people that have to go out every day to make a living. You and I know that. And there are a large percentage of the population. And when you are Kaduna State, 89% of our population is young. 60% of the GDP is informal. People that open their shops on a day-to-day -day basis. You have to do something. You have to feed those people that stay at home and cannot earn a living day to day. And to do so, you have to sacrifice. So our first month, we took 500 million naira from, from our contingency uh, budget, and we bought food items and distributed to those that we consider the most vulnerable. By the second month, we had run out of funds. The only way we could raise money to feed those people is for us that have a job and an assured income to sacrifice. And this is the basis for it. We didn't cut down I think people's maybe, salaries. Maybe, maybe, we maybe, said, maybe we was, said contribute. Maybe I mean, we said contribute. It, oh, so were the people consulted before this was done? They were consulted after we took the decision. Okay. Okay. But, maybe that's but the issue. Some, yeah. But, but that is like, they, have the, they, they could have said, we don't agree. They didn't. And we went right. ahead. Okay? And if well, they I... felt that the decision I took was uh, illegal or, or unlawful, there are always the courts to settle this argument. So we are, we, we are very open about it. And this is why, as, as political appointees, we sacrifice more. We give 50% of our salaries and allowances to show that you know, this is about coming together, about collaboration, about our common humanity and solidarity. One of the things that I hope we can talk about is this break, breakdown of trust between the government and um, the governing in Nigeria, particularly this time around. It's been coming for a while, but I think it's really peaked now. But some, mm. one of the things that's, that's an issue in Kaduna State, and it's interesting that even during the pandemic, it did not seem to stop. And that's the massacre, that's the violence that's been going on in Southern Kaduna. I mean, Madam, mm. what is really going on? For me, uh, there is a difference between what the headlines in the papers say and social media and the reality. What is the reality? Let me start with the reality. The reality is that the entire Northwest region of Nigeria, all the seven states, plus some states in North Central, have been under a scourge of banditry. This did not start today, okay? This started a long time ago, three years, four years ago, from cattle rustling to 
kidnapping and so on. It's something we're dealing with in Sokoto, in Katsina, in Zamfara, in Kebi, in Niger, in Kaduna State. This has been going on, even though the media seems not to have noticed, but it has been going on. Then there have been killings everywhere, there have been kidnaps everywhere, there have been extortion everywhere. In fact, my biggest problem now with the rainy season coming is how do we wipe out the remnants of the bandits so that our people can go to the farm? Unfortunately, when a hundred people are killed in Zamfara State, it's not news. Why? Because it is full Fulani's killing Hausa people. So it's not an issue. It's okay. Gambari kill Hausa man. No backs. However, in Kaduna State, because we have more ethnic groups, more diversity, the story, the narrative is changed, which is what I'm saying is not the reality. Okay? These bandits don't care. They don't know your ethnic group or religion by looking at your face. They attack, they kidnap, they kill. When they kill... Okay, now, most of the bandits are Fulanese, yeah? Muslims, in quote. When they kill a fellow Fulani or Muslim, it's okay. It's not news. But when they kill a Christian, that's when it becomes news. And, oh, there is massacre in southern Kaduna. There is this, there is that. Southern Kaduna has been an epicenter of, of, of ethno-religious intolerance for 40 years. Fumi. The first crisis we had in Kaduna State that of ethno-religious nature was in 1980 in Kaswa in present Kaduna local government. It's been there even though people have not noticed. But it is my job to understand this, to study this, and deal with it. And we're trying to deal with it the best way we can. However, there are people with political agendas, there are people with religious agendas that try to change this narrative from what it is to something else. Okay? This is going all over. You know that just last week, villages in Sokoto State were wiped mm -hmm. out and killed. Why is it not genocide? Why is it uh, uh, different from uh, the same thing happening in, 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 in Kajuru or, or any part of the state? Just yesterday, I woke up, I was in Abuja. I woke up to outbreak of violence in two local governments in my state. Why? What happened? And someone went to the farm and he was killed. God knows who killed him. His body was found dead in his farm, in Zambokat, in, 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 in Kauru local government, another local government. What was the reaction? Because he happened to be a Christian, Christians in another local government started protesting and, and killing, and we have not finished all these uh, rescue and search operations yet. But people, uh, you know, some, some, some people traveling in their car three people were burnt to death just because they happened to pass through there. Is that right? Why would you do that? The authorities are trying their best. We have police. We have everything to deal with these issues. There is a legal system. Why do you take the law into your own hands? This is what is happening. This is why, you know, you, 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 you have these issues in Kajuru. You have these issues in Zambokata. Uh, uh, Two, two guys, a Hausa, uh, Fulani Muslim, and a Baju Christian go to a bar to drink. They have an argument over a girl, and they start fighting. Because they start fighting over a girl, after two bottles of beer each, the, the individual conflict becomes a group conflict. Yeah. The Muslims take sides against the Christian. The Christians take sides against the Muslim. Before you know it, the whole town is engulfed in crisis. This is what we've been dealing with. This is what the newspapers don't report. And this situation has been going, as I said, for 40 years. It's complicated. We are handling it. In fact, it has gone down considerably con 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 compared to previous years. And we are dealing with it the best way we can. But the attitude of some of the leaders is unhelpful. That perhaps mm. it's because the expectation is higher for you. And then there was the issue of Elza exactly, where it's perceived that, well, you know, that particular case has been handled the way, handled the way it is. It means that, I mean, I hear your name and I hear words like dictatorship. 
Do you know what I mean? I hear anti-democracy. I hear, you know, all of that. I hear clamp down on um, dissent, <laughs> on opposition, on journalists and all of that. Do you want to address what really Look. the issue is with El Zanzaki and all of that? Because it seems to have started falling apart from there. I never hear anybody, I never read any reports about, oh, he's corrupt. For me, uh, l let me start with the journal, then I go to the particular about El Zanzaki and everything else. Um, I don't tolerate nonsense, okay? And I don't like people that have double standards. I'm objective, I'm consistent, I operate on the basis of laws and rules, okay? If you're a journalist, report the truth, you will not have issues with me. But if you concoct falsehood that is likely to lead to loss of lives and property in a sensitive state like Kaduna, which has 40 years of history of violence around ethno-religious issues, I will go after you. I don't care what you say. I'm dictatorial, I'm high-handed. Luca Biniet concocted falsehood, a story. Put it in the vanguard, which could have led to the loss of lives and property. And because he's a journalist, he's immune from prosecution. No way. I'm going to go after him. He's going to jail if I have my way. Okay? Mm -hmm. Vanguard fired him when they found out that he concocted falsehood. Any case you see of us going after journalists is because they have concocted falsehood. They are not journalists. They have abused their professional ethics. And we have laws in Kaduna State that enable us to prosecute injurious falsehood, hate speech, and so on and so forth. I'm just doing what I swore to do, which is to uphold the law. I didn't make the law. It is there. Okay? And I don't convict people. I take them to court. From Audu Kori, who sat in his comfortable office in Lagos or Patakot and tweeted that people had been killed in a college of education. Mass comm students had been killed from a college of education, and they are of a particular ethnic group inviting that ethnic group to retaliate. And we checked, we found that it was not true. In many respects, no college of education offers mass communication. Colleges of education train people to be teachers. Okay? I called Audu myself. I said, Audu, you are wrong. This story is not true. He insisted it was true. M much later, even after the school issued a statement that nothing like this happened, we don't have any such students, and it took the deployment of the military in that area to contain a likely, li likely backlash. And then you want me to let Audumayokori walk scot-free just because he found out that his driver lied to him. If your driver li it to told you something, don't go and tweet it. Cross-check. You can call people. And after you tweeted, and I, as the governor of the state, said, I have checked. This is not true. I have security information. I get all, the first thing I read every morning is a security briefing on the situation of the state. Every kidnap, every murder, every criminal attack, I get a report first thing in the morning. And I tell you, this is not true. And you say, no, you stand by your story. I have to prosecute you. It is my duty to prosecute you. Chidi Odinkalu sat in his office, sat, you know, went, went to channels, television, yes. and said that no person was killed in Kajuru. I got written report from the military, from the SSS, from the police, confirming that people had been killed. 66 people, 32 initially we had, had been killed. We went to the place with the military and the police and confirmed that about 66 people. Subsequently, the full army submitted a list of 132 killed. I get this information because I'm the governor, because the security agencies report to me. But Chidi sits in channels without the control of any security agency, without any information, and said he's calling me out. I'm lying. I'm the governor of the state. He is sitting in Abuja. He knows more about Kaduna State than I do. I have to prosecute him. It's called injurious falsehood. It's I called think, incitement. I think, I think, there, are offenses, there are offenses under the penal code, and it is my duty under the Constitution to prosecute him. Now, the judge can say he's innocent. Hmm. I have no problems with that. I don't convict 
but we have a legal system and it is my duty to file charges against Chidi and he's running all over the place avoiding facing a judge in Kaduna but he will face a judge in Kaduna because he you know and Chidi is my friend he could have called me and said Mala this thing that uh, you said yesterday I, 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 I've checked uh, with my contacts in Kaduna it's not true then I can share with him privileged information that will change his mind but he didn't he went on TV because it's popular to tweet nonsense and get followers Malam, and know, the consequences and the consequences of what you tweet, I have to deal with. I have to spend scarce resources on security to ensure that people are not killed, property is not lost. This is the issue. Now, because I don't take this kind of nonsense, I'm a dictator. I am not democratic. I'm this and that. Let's come back to Al Zaki. Al Zaki and I were members of the Muslim Soul Society of Ahmad Bell University back in 19. 70s before he was expelled yeah. he was expelled from abu because he came up with this slogan islam only they wanted every non-muslim out of Ahmad Bella university the mss was this, uh, was broken into two and he led the extreme faction that wanted every non-muslim out of Ahmad Bella university this is how it started he was dismissed from the university in his final year he went to iran completed his studies and came back with the Ayatollah Khomeini Iranian Revolution agenda. This is what he's trying to implement. His base is in Kaduna. El Zaki doesn't recognize the Nigerian constitution, doesn't recognize that it's a governor in Kaduna state, and he feels that he's above the law. His followers feel that they are above the law. They block highways, they, they go on marches, and so on. And I'm supposed to sit at the governor of the state and do nothing. No way. I had sent him a warning, stop doing this, you're breaking the law, stop it. He did not stop until he went and blocked the road against the chief of army staff who was going to an event. That's how the problem started. And you know the army have only one weapon. Mm -hmm. The smallest weapon they will have is called a gun. So when you block the road and soldiers are coming and you say they cannot pass, you must expect that at some point they will use that rifle. This is what happened to Lezal Zaki. And it led to the death of 320-something citizens of Kaduna State that we had to pick from the streets and bury while he was sitting comfortably, in, in, you, you know, and, and giving directions. And we are supposed to let him just walk away. No, we set up a commission of inquiry led, led by a very senior court of appeal judge and very reputable Nigerians from across Nigeria. They sat... They took evidence from everyone and they gave several decisions, but I'll mention just two. The first was that they said that the military were high-handed. They, 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 they used disproportionate force yeah. against al Zaki and his people and they should be, those responsible should be investigated and court-martialed. Yeah. Okay? They made that recommendation. The second recommendation was El Zabzeki was should be held responsible for the conduct of his followers and all the violations of the law that followed in a period of 33 years and recommended that the IMN should be uh, proscribed. IMN is El Zabzeki's uh, movement, Islamic movement in Nigeria or something. They recommend they should be proscribed and he should be held criminally responsible for what happened. That's what we are doing. We are, we've charged him to court. He's facing charges before the Kaduna State High Court, ranging from homicide to lesser charges, kidnapping, or, you know, abducting young people and so on and so forth, over a period of 33 years. He's before a judge. It's my duty to prosecute al Zaki. al Zaki is a Muslim, just like me. But it doesn't matter whether you're a Muslim, Christian, Hausa, Fulani, Igbo, if you come to Kaduna State and break the law, the law will go after you. That's what I'm doing. But people think, say that's, that's dictatorial. Yeah, I think, I think uh, Malan, perhaps could it be that it's the manner in which some of these things are handled? So, for example, El Zaki, when he was supposed to be released, maybe he ought to have been released. You know, just follow the process of the law to no, the no. letter. Fumi, let me explain something. El Zaki was first taken by the federal government. It was the SSS that kept him in Abuja. 
It was while he was in the custody of the SSS in Abuja that his lawyers filed a suit of fundamental human rights requiring that he should be released or charged to court. Because our constitution is clear. Within 48 hours of being in custody of law enforcement agencies, you should be charged before a court of law. The federal government did not do that. That's, that's why they got a judgment, a ruling by a federal high court, release a Zedzeki. Now, my understanding is that the federal government appealed that judgment. So that's the federal government. But at that time, he was in the custody of the federal government. Kaduna State was not yet ready to file charges against him because we were doing painstaking investigations dating back 33 years. When we became ready, we asked the federal government to hand him over to us. So today, El Zagzaki is being in prison custody on the orders of Kaduna State High Court, not federal high court. So if you want to ask why was Azakzaki not released at the time, please ask the federal government and the Attorney General of the Federation. We are not part of it. We took him, we, we brought him to Kaduna and charged him before a Kaduna High Court for crimes committed in Kaduna State. The federal government may have other charges against him for federal crimes, but we are, right now he is in lawful custody on the orders of a court, and he's in prison, actually, awaiting trial, and the trial is going on. So, Mama, I, I'm going to dovetail on that a bit to something else that happened during this um, COVID ongoing, because we seem to forget that we still yes. are in COVID, um, in the pandemic, you know, and yeah. we talk about, you know, what the future might be. But one of the important things that happened is that COVID seems to have presented an opportunity to do something about the imaginary um, system. I mean, you, you and um, other northern governors have come out strongly to say this is the end of the emergency system, which seemed like something that was impossible um, before. I know also there was the issue of, you know, taking them from one state to the other, some from Kano to, it became a bit confusing. But now, where are we? Is it, because we hear it and we think it's not possible. How can they possibly do that? And they, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of children I'm imagining. What yeah. will happen to these children? What is the process of actually putting them back into you know, a regular system? And um, what is the political implication of that? Because it's been argued before in the past that actually the Amajiri system provided fodder, not only for political disorder, but also for religious disorder. The Amajiri system was a system of education that existed in the Muslim parts of the North long before colonialism. Okay. However, it has not been modernized. It has, we, we've made our research. It has not worked anywhere in the world. It doesn't give life skills and so on. But in northern Nigeria in particular, and I can say it because, you know, I am a northerner. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm from here. And if you say it, you'd be accused. But I can say it. It is only in northern Nigeria that people on a salary of 10,000 naira a month will marry four wives, have 15 children, and outsource their upbringing to the society. You can't have children and then take them at the age of five and hand them over to some malam to bring them up, to feed them, to clothe them, and educate them, and give them where to sleep without paying the malam a penny. It's an unsustainable system. It's an irresponsible system. It is parental irresponsibility. I have allowed it to go on for too long. Okay? I am very, very proud that the Northern State Governors Forum, under the leadership of uh, Governor Lalong of Plateau State, has finally faced this problem. It's a major social problem. It's not an Islamic problem. There are many Islamic nations. They don't practice al Majiri system. The only country that practices something similar to that, and we know the results, is Afghanistan. Hmm. Okay? It's not an Islamic system at all. There are Islamic countries that we can go and study. They don't have that system. Okay? And Islamic education and modern education are not mutually exclusive. I got Islamic education, but under the care of my parents. I went to primary school in the morning, and in the, in the late afternoon, I go to Islamic school. That's how I got my Islamic education. What is wrong with such a system? How can you take your child and outsource his upbringing to someone else and think that there will not be bad consequences. We've allowed it to go on for too long. Now, those that make the argument that al are used 
for political reasons are wrong. I have run for office twice. Al-Majiris are not part of my campaign. They are not part of anything. And they are, most Al-Majiris are aged between 5 and 15 years. And they are too young to vote. They don't register to vote. They don't know even their civic rights. Okay? This is what we want to cure. So these are now, children being abused, they, really? They are being abused. It is parents giving up their responsibilities to someone. And these children, they get beaten habitually. And we just found out that they must bring 200 naira. In Kaduna State, al Majiris must bring 200 naira to their malam every Wednesday. That's why they have to go and beg. They have to do odd jobs at the age of 5 to 15. It's a violation of their rights. We, I okay. also have reports that some of the boys are sexually molested. They are sexually molested, but it's even worse than that for me. Because we initially thought when we began to look at this problem, that the Almajiri phenomenon is a boy-child education problem. We found that there are girls involved. We got two Almajiri schools in Zaria that had boys and girls Almajiris sleeping together. And you know what can happen. We have the two malams being prosecuted under our child rights uh, law. But this is what is going on. And this, is, this affects millions of children. Millions for me. You are talking of thousands. No, millions. In Kaduna State alone, we have repatriated 35,000 Almajiris back to their states of origin. And why are we saying they should go back to their states of origin? Because they want them back under parental care. Of course, every Nigerian citizen can be anywhere. But below a certain age, you have to be under the care of your parents, not under the care of some mana. He cannot do it. You have so to be how, under the how, how, how so, this system is, is gone on for so long. The numbers of children are so large. A lot of the parents are destitute. How will this process no, now occur? So, yes, okay. I, I will explain the Kaduna state model, which is more or less what all the states have adopted. Okay? Our model is simply this. From the age of 6 to the age of 18, every child in Kaduna state must go to school primary, junior secondary, and senior secondary school education in Kaduna State is free and compulsory. Okay? We already have the Universal Basic Education Act that makes primary and junior secondary school compulsory anyway. Okay? So at least nine years of education in Nigeria, throughout Nigeria, is free. But in Kaduna State, we have scaled it up to include senior secondary education. So you must go to school if you're a child in Kaduna State age between the age of 6 and 18, you cannot go to any so-called al Majiri school. So all these children are being returned to their parents, properly documented with the help of UNICEF. We are working closely with UNICEF. And as soon as schools open, each and every child will be traced and be taken to school to continue. Now, those that are 15 years of age, of course, we can't put them in class one. We want to have a special program for them that will give them numeracy, literacy skills, and then take them to vocational schools so that they can have some life skills. Because one of the dangers of the Almajiri system is that you just cram the Quran, you don't get any modern education, and you have no life skills. Attempts have been made in the past to, in, to integrate Western and Almajiri education, but it has not gone anywhere. Almajiri schools have been established, but they are a drop in the ocean. You are talking of millions of children you can't build two Almajiri schools in Kaduna State and tell me you are serious about addressing the Almajiri problem. And that is not even the issue. We don't want the stigma of Almajiri around any school. Every child should simply just go to school, but under the care of his or her parents. This is what we are trying to do. So we are trying to get all the children back to their states of origin, back to their parents, so that they all go to school. Now, when they go to school in the morning, up to the afternoon, in the evening, they can go to Islamic schools and get the same al Majiri kind of education, but under the care of their parents and after they have gone to proper schools in the morning. That is the plan. That is what we adopted in the Northern State Governors Forum. Each state will adjust to its own nuances because, you know, Kaduna has a different set of challenges and issues than Kano has. Mm -hmm. And we, we said that apart from this broad principle of that every child must have education, 
modern education and Islamic education are not mixed, they're exclusive. Every child must be under the care of his parents up to a certain age. Everyone can go and implement what works best for his state. So that's what we are doing. So, I mean, talk, that, I, I want to see that. I really want to see it. I want to see it happen over the years. And that's one of the things I would like to keep an eye out on. It is going to happen things. for me. I assure I, you, in Kaduna State, it is going to happen. I can't speak for everyone. I can't speak for every governor. But I know that my colleagues are committed to this. But in Kaduna State, it is going to happen. And this is, this is, this is why some people say, oh, he's dictatorial. You know, as I said, Pumi, I don't take nonsense. You cannot play with, the, with a child's rights, his future, everything, out of sheer parental irresponsibility. And we do nothing. We are right. doing something. Kaduna State do also has done something really, really interesting recently. I think that's the first time, I don't know if there's a precedence, that somebody is being charged for the rape of a two-year-old, that person is going to, <laughs> that person is going to, what's the charge again? He's, he's going to hang. He's going to, he's going to hang. And, I'm, yeah. and, and, and anytime the papers are brought to me, he's I feel exhausted, I will sign it. Because no one should do that. So no that gets, we have, you know, we, we have a very, we have a very active commissioner of human services that pursues these cases. You know, there is a rape epidemic in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we must take a very, very strong and hardline stance to end it. And it will not be done if we don't, you know, have very, 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 very aggressive legislation and prosecution. In Kaduna State, we amended our penal court to make rape a life sentence offense, okay? We are amending it now to make the rape of a child to attract the death penalty. Because nobody should do that. No one should do that. No one should be allowed to do that. We've been too soft with these crimes, and we must wake up and do something. But I'm happy that there is enough awareness now. And, you know, uh, I, I, I believe that uh, this is the beginning of the end for rapists. For rapists. I mean, talking about rape, also, just talking about women generally, your state does quite well. Because I know that you have, like, up to almost 50% women in, um, in cabinet positions in Kajina State. Uh, your former yes. chief of staff was female. Um, yes. So there's a good record of... The... And my deputy is female. The yeah. only one in northern Nigeria. The only one. So it's quite remarkable. And also this strong stance against rape and you know, violence. However, you know, there was a, a situation recently, and I'd like you to address it. Your son, um, Ben, got into yes. some sort of yeah, situation. Because the question I wanted to ask you was, you know, apart, because we all live this life, social media, and the answer of social media. When you saw what Bilo tweeted, what did you say to him privately? Well, look, I don't want to go into a private discussion between father and son. Uh, because this is a public forum. Um, but I believe that at the end of it, my son uh, did the right thing by apologizing and so on and so forth. But my son is 32 years old. He is a, he is an adult. He should be held responsible for what he does. It is not for people to ask me to explain the conduct of my son. I have done my best to bring him up, up to the age of 18, 20. I put him through university. He has a master's degree. He should answer for whatever he has done. Yes, I've had a conversation with him, but it is not for this forum, frankly. I have a very good relationship with my children. They speak to me easily. They come to me when they have problems. Um, but... I think he has done the right thing uh, in the end. I think he, he, he made a mistake, you know, to, to take the behavior of one person and characterize an entire ethnic group. Of course, it's wrong. It's not the way I brought him up. But uh, I think in the end, he has tried to fix uh, the situation. But I don't want to reveal what I discussed with my children or with my spouses you know, on a public platform. When you and I meet, you can <laughs> yeah, ask me that question ask and, I'll, and, I, and I can tell you. Yeah. But yeah. not here. The thing I must repeat again is that Kaduna State has a really impressive track record. It's almost like you, 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 you weigh it on one hand and you're like, okay, all of this is happening. But also, here's this man that generates so strong emotions. Uh, how, how would you measure the effectiveness of the um, system they adapt uh, adopted regarding the uh, margins? That's one question. 
What would be yeah, the well, success? Yeah, well, you, you know, for me, having every child in school is the beginning. Okay? Once we have every child in school, I will sleep better. Okay? I will be satisfied. Now, the, the challenge with education is that it's a 30-year investment. Yeah. What we are doing now is only in about 30 years that we'll see the outcomes. And this is why, this is why it is not politically um, attractive to invest in education. And this is why edu public education has collapsed in Nigeria. Because it takes 30 years for you to see the result. You invest today, you don't see the immediate result. You build a, a, a bridge, a, a, a dual carriage where people clap for you because they can see it. Education yeah. is, is more subtle. Okay? So for me, um, we would only know the effectiveness of our policies 30 years from now when we are probably gone. I, I'm not sure I'm, I'll be here 30 years from now. However, my conscience would be clear. And I'll sleep better at night if I know that every child in Kaduna State is getting, is in school and he's getting quality public education. And we've invested a lot in the last five years to make our public schools better. In fact, to make this point, I took my own child to a public school. Right. And I have encouraged... I, 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 uh, I saw that and I was like... Yeah. And I've yeah. encouraged my commissioners and, 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 and senior government officials to take their children to public school because it is only if our children are in public school that ordinary people will believe that we're doing our best to make public education what it used to be. I went to public school, primary school, secondary school, university. And today, most people of, uh, of, 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 of my income bracket will take their children to private schools or even abroad. Right. And that I, is wrong. We have I, to make public schools work for everybody. And this is what we are trying to do. I'm going to have a long conversation with you one of these days because there's so much to talk about with you. And people, people are sending questions and comments which we can't take. I mean, there's, some, there's one particular question because my producer is saying to me, round it up, you can't take all the questions. But the one about climate change, I think it's important, you know, yes. because of the rains and the implications for agriculture. I know that recently, Kaduna States, you know, recorded incredible um, records for uh, internally generated revenues. Um, you've jumped up God knows how many steps. I mean, in terms of just all of that, the hard fact statistics of economics, of reorganizing things, all the research I've done seems to be on the up. You know, the conversations are all, all the other conversations are. But what I want to ask is about, you know, what can Nigeria learn from this big pause? Especially somebody who who was ill with COVID. And I didn't ask you then if you worried at any point if this was it for you. For me, I, I think it is, it's, 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 you know, the COVID-19 pandemic is a great opportunity. It is here, we have to deal with it, but it's a great opportunity in many ways. First, um, it has brought to the fore the vulnerability of the elite with regards our healthcare system. The elite are used to flying out, you know, go to private clinics or go to mm -hmm. go abroad for a medical treatment. We couldn't do that. We had to be treated. I was treated by Kaduna State medical personnel. No one could go anywhere. That means we must fix our public health system. Yeah. We cannot escape to Germany or Saudi Arabia or London anymore. Okay. So that's one opportunity, and I, we are doing that. At least in Kaduna State, we are doing that. I know in many states, because as part of the Nigerian Governance Forum, I know we are scaling up our investments in the public health system, which is a good thing. Another thing that the pandemic has shown very, very clearly is we are on our own. You know, we have to be self-sufficient. If we have had to import food, you know, I, we wanted to buy testing kits, uh, for instance, for COVID-19 from the U.S., Trump said, no, no testing kits will be exported out of the U.S. The company had to get their factory in Sweden to provide the testing kits to us. So this shows that the world is closing. And every country must move towards basic self-sufficiency. Globalization has fallen apart. We are moving towards an era of increased nationalism. Again, this is an opportunity. I'm happy that Nigeria is, uh, is part of the Africa free trade area. This is an opportunity for Nigeria to lead Africa towards self-sufficiency and for us to trade with, within our continent to, 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 to be our brother's keepers. 
the rest of the world doesn't care, will not stand for us. Okay. Thirdly, I think COVID-19 also has given us the opportunity to sit back and reflect on what is really important. Both at individual level, group level, state level, and national level, and even at continental level. Because when you are isolated for 26 days, you have the opportunity to really reflect on your life's priorities. And when you are at the risk of losing your life, though I, you know, there was never a point that I thought I wasn't going to beat it, frankly. But still, you have to reflect and say, what is important? How have I been spending my time, my resources? You know, what is important? And what comes out of this pandemic is that the most important human attribute is the quality of social relationships. Absolutely. It is that, more than that. And finally, COVID-19 has also shown to us that going forward, the world is going to be mostly virtual. Hmm. The office is about to die. Most people will work from home. So what does that mean? It means we need an advanced digital infrastructure. We must have 4G, 5G across every village in Nigeria because education is likely to be mostly virtual. Healthcare, telemedicine will, will you know, nobody wants to go to the hospital because you could get infected by COVID-19. You rather call your doctor, get your prescription, order your medicine from the pharmacy for it to be delivered to your house. So this is the future. This is the new normal. And Nigeria must be prepared for it. We in Kaduna State, we've decided that that's the way we are going. If Nigeria goes that way, alhamdulillah. If not, we are going to go that way. And we are very determined about it. With, 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 with Instagram, is it's time. I have one minute left and it will cut me off. Malam, I want to thank you for this conversation. I mean, the thing about the environment, if we get answers, we'll send it to our people. Because I think it's also connected to the security yeah. issues, and farming and yes. all of that. But yes. once again, thank you you know, for this conversation. It's good to see you again after 10 years. And I will make sure that it's no longer 10 years before I see you next time. Thank you. Thank you for me. Thank you for inviting me. I enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. That's my conversation with Malam Elrufai, the executive governor of Kadina State. If you have more questions, if you send them, we will send this forward.